Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's web conference, California's Secure Food Supply Program. Please note that all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the presentation. We will provide you with instructions on how to ask a verbal question at that time. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. Please select the participants menu, which is at the top of your screen, and opt to send note to all presenters. If you have logged in using the web-based application, you can use the notes tab, which you'll see on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and please address your question to all moderators. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Liz Clark. Please go ahead, Liz. Good morning and good afternoon since we're on a couple different time zones here. Um, I'm Liz Clark with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to thank you for joining us for the webinar today. Our speaker is Dr. Mandy Aaron. Dr. Aaron's joined California Department of Food and Agriculture in May of 2017. At CDFA, she manages the Animal Disease Traceability and Secure Food Supplies Initiative. Before coming to CDFA, she was the program manager at the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security at UC Davis, where she oversaw and contributed to a number of training and educational projects with USDA, FDA, and DHS. The projects were broad in scope and involved producer training videos for secure milk supply, inspector and investigator training pertaining to the Food Safety Modernization Act, developing two DHS courses on animals and disasters and community preparedness for food and agriculture-related disasters, and overseeing delivery of a series of courses on ag terrorism. Prior to her position at Western Institute, Dr. Ahrens was a science and technology policy fellow and spent a year working in the California Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee analyzing bills and participating in committee hearings. She received her DVM, MPVM, and PhD degrees from UC Davis and was also a small practitioner in Marin County, California. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ahrens. All right, well, thank you, Liz. Um, I want to say hello to everybody and thank you for the opportunity today to talk with you about California's Secure Food Supply Program. Since we have potentially a broad audience, I'm going to hit on a number of points related to the California program. Um, I'm going to touch on why we need biosecurity and the National Secure Food Supply Programs to provide some context for the California program. I'm also going to be presenting and focusing on the California approach, our rationale, how it differs from the national approach, and the architecture of our program. I'm also going to be presenting where we are in our current program implementation and our vision for the future. So with that, before we get started, next slide. I wanted to give you a picture of myself um, so that you have a face to go with the voice. So here's a picture, I'm the adult in the picture, just in case you didn't know, um, of me with my kiddos enjoying some different outings in sunny California. Um, okay, and then moving right along and jumping into our presentation, next. Today, though, we're here to talk about biosecurity is at the heart of what we're talking about. And biosecurity as it pertains to what we can do to prepare for as well as put into practice during an outbreak to minimize disease spread and more importantly, or not more importantly, but as importantly, keep our livestock economy alive and, and healthy. Next slide, please. So many of you have probably seen the statistic out of the 2001 foot and mouth disease outbreak in the UK where it showed that farmers who had good biosecurity procedures were five times less likely to become infected. I think I like to be reminded of this statistic and um, it's one that I commonly use because it reminds me that what we are talking about, biosecurity, which can at times seem daunting to put together and to implement but it is worth the effort, so it does help us in the end. Um, and it's nice to have those success stories to uh, keep us focused and keep us motivated, particularly when, again, it might seem a little overwhelming. Okay, next slide. When there's an outbreak of a foreign animal disease or reportable disease, notifiable animal disease, kind of however you want to call them, um, we look at having four goals. The first, of course, comes that we want to prevent the disease. We want to do our best to prevent it from ever occurring and infecting our animal populations in the first place. Next. 
The second goal is once it is, has been found or is in our animal, animal populations, we want to slow or stop the spread of disease. Third, we want to eliminate the disease and hope to return to a sense of normalcy, normal business practices, normal health, normal economies. But then our fourth goal we've realized doesn't, that the first three don't really matter if we don't have a, um, an agricultural economy to return to, back to normal. So it's become clear that we must maintain a continuity of business while we are doing those other three goals. And of course, maintaining this continuity of business is the goal of the Secure Food Supply Program. So nationally, we have these six plans that many of you are probably familiar with. Up on the screen, you will see the, um, the three poultry plans. Down below are the uh, hoofstock plans. Um, and these have been worked on over a number of years by many individuals and organizations state animal health associations and agencies, academia, industry. A lot of people have been really invested and invested a lot of time and energy to really outline um, biosecurity practices relative to each specific commodity um, as it might be impacted by a disease. These programs have primarily been funded by the USDA. Um, and California has been an active participant in many of these efforts and plans. Next slide. At the heart of all of these plans, of course, is the idea of enhanced biosecurity. And by enhanced biosecurity, what we're looking at is increased biosecurity measures such that during an outbreak, regulatory officials can be reasonably assured that disease spread is mitigated such that permits can be issued to move products such as milk or eggs. It is the moving of products that is essential to keeping the industries economically alive at the end of an outbreak. Next slide. In California, we too had started down the path of having commodity-specific plans. However, following the 2015 high path even influenza outbreak, our secure food supply team, with the guidance from our state veterinarian, Dr. Jones, decided that for California, we wanted to unify our approach and bring all of the commodities under one secure food supply program. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about California's program, which is why we're here today. Um, if you want more information on those national commodity-based plans, there's lots of information on the web, and or there are other recorded webinars on those programs. Next. So why did California decide to go for a unified approach? One of the main drivers is actually resources, specifically human resources. Like many states, human resources can become a limiting or at least a guiding factor in how decisions are made. At CDFA, we have a small team working on the program specifics and the structure, the developers. They're the ones that are thinking through all of the, the what ifs and the contingencies and the practices within the industry and trying to come up with what are the requirements? Where are we going to draw those lines of what is required versus what might be nice for them to do, but they can do it however they can put it together? So we have a small team who is kind of holding those, those thoughts and putting that together. Then we have our team of responders, um, which we draw on a lot of people, but it's still a, a discrete unit of people. And one of the limiting factors is that we have one permit desk albeit we have more than one person who sits on the desk, but we really have a, a very small tight unit who is doing permitting. And this is regardless of the disease or the species involved. Next please. Um, during an outbreak, our developers will often become part of our response unit. They can become responders either out in the field or they might even be working um, in the permitting unit, depending on where they are needed at the, during the incident management. Next slide. The important part, though, is that it's these same people are responsible for knowing and understanding the food supply, the secure food supply program, whether we are talking about avian influenza, exotic Newcastle disease. Next slide. Next slide. Foot and mouth disease or any other disease that's affecting livestock. So regardless of the species affected or the disease, 
it became clear that we needed one playbook that everyone could follow. We didn't want to have separate guidance that our teams had to pull down um, for all the different commodities. We wanted them to learn and become familiar with and know the protocols associated with that one playbook. So let's take a look at what this means for the California program and how we differ from the national program. First of all, I want to reiterate that the California program is built off of the various national programs. Our team either worked on or read through the national level documents for the various commodity plans. We picked out what worked for California and what our regulatory officials were comfortable with. We made modifications as necessary to fit CDFA's needs as a regulatory agency responding to these events in our state, as well as to the industry needs of the industry here in California. One of the changes that was made to accommodate the California industry had to do with terminology. And one of the main differences here between the California and the national plan has to do with the use and the location of the term line of separation, which is in essence a line separate in biosecure and a clean area from a dirty area. I want to point this out because people who are familiar with the national plans, if you read the California plan, it could be confusing when we start talking about line of separation because it's in a slightly different place. As many of you probably know, the national plans put the line of separation around the premises premises property, that's kind of at the property line, if you will, the, out, the outer border. However, in California, our industries were much more familiar calling this the perimeter. And then we have internal lines of separation around specific areas within the premises. So here's a picture to show you what that looks like. Um, so in California, that orange dotted line around the outside is actually called the perimeter. And then the red solid lines in the middle um, around the poultry houses here are the internal lines of separation. The principles are the same. The terms are just slightly different. Next slide. So for California, as I said, we, want, we picked out pieces that we felt were specific to California. And so we have some California-specific standards. Um, basically, what we did was we minimized some of the options when it came to the standards that were presented in the national plans. The national plans were designed to present the minimum biosecurity practices to prevent disease spread, as well as to be flexible to the state's needs. As our team reviewed the commodity plans and the options presented for certain practices, they made decisions regarding those practices that they felt we could be comfortable with that would ensure a biosecurity level here in California that, that made everybody feel safe in terms of mitigating those disease spread. For example, the California standards say that the driver of a hauling vehicle, and again, we're talking about generalizing it here to all commodities, so this driver could be of a milk tanker, it could be a truck transporting eggs or replacement pullets, it could be a feed truck driver, et cetera. Whoever is driving the hauling vehicle must remain in the cab of the truck unless it is absolutely necessary. Now the national plan recommends the hauler stay in the cab, but then also they have provisions that can be taken should they need to get should they need to get out of the cab. So it, they're similar. Um, it's just a nuanced difference, if you will. So California has just taken a bit more stricter of an approach to say, nope, we really think the hauler and the driver needs to stay in the cab unless there are extenuating circumstances. The effect of this approach is that producers then need to be prepared to perform the functions that's normally pre performed by the driver, such as loading or unloading animal products or feed, or loading or unloading animals, or taking samples. So it does have some downstream effects um, as far as what the requirements are, because it takes them off of the driver and puts them onto the producer. Another example of a standard that we slightly changed is the example of the movement of the perimeter to accommodate the milk house on a dairy. So here's what that looks like. Next slide. This image shows the perimeter as the dashed orange line being moved off the property line to be closer to the milk house. Kind of that red circle is, is what I'm talking about. For those who are unfamiliar with this, by moving the perimeter, the milk taker truck remains outside the premises perimeter and thus does not need to be cleaned and disinfected to pick up milk. They remain in the quote-unquote dirty zone. 
The National Secure Milk Supply Plan presents several options for this perimeter move movement and for ways in which to safely transfer milk from the milk house into the tanker. In California, we have decided to minimize this option for our premises. We're saying that it can be done to move that um, perimeter, as we call it, when needed, but only under very specific circumstances, such as if there's no feasible location, there's not enough space to have a cleaning and disinfection station for the tanker truck near the milk house. Um, and the perimeter as it moves in must not be near animal housing. So we have lots of requirements for when this can be done or not done. And for us, it's more the exception rather than the rule. Okay, next slide. And lastly, and probably the biggest difference in the California plan has to do with the plan architecture. As I mentioned, we have unified under one secure food supply plan such that we have key components in the general plan and then commodity-specific standards under species tabs. I'm going to go into this in more detail in just a few moments. Next slide. I'm going to step back for a minute and look at the whole program. So as we look at our biosecurity process and our secure food system program, um, and we want to bring people on board, we're looking at these five steps, plan creation, pre-certification, activation, verification, and permit issuance. So I'm going to walk through these five steps as I explain our program. Now one quick note to add is that in the vision and hope is that everyone will have their plan created and be pre-certified before an outbreak. So I think that's kind of everyone's goal and vision is that we're all ready and prepared ahead of time. Um, so anyway, just to keep in mind that that is still our vision and our, and our plan as we move forward here. Okay, next slide. As we began our unified approach, we looked at the supply chain, and while all of these components, the farm premises, the haulers, the processors, and even the renderers, all need to remain functional for continuity of business, we had to pick one place to start. We couldn't tackle all aspects of the supply chain simultaneously. Next slide. So we decided to start with the farm premises. Our thinking was that if we could lock down the castle, we would make a big step towards mitigating disease spread. And if the farm premises aren't in business, then sort of no one else is really in business either. So that became our goal and our focus. Thus, our team has created a farm premises guidance as our starting point. Currently, the guidance has the general sections I alluded to, as well as species tabs for poultry and dairy. Our guidance document was finalized earlier this year. The guidance is similar to the national program in that it provides the specific standards or requirements that are necessary for a producer to meet in order to qualify for an animal or animal product movement permit. Our guidance requires producers to include standard operating procedures within their plan. The little asterisk there is to remind me that, again, this is a slight deviation from some of the national plans in the sense that we require those SOPs to be written as part of the pre-certification process because we want to see those SOPs and evaluate them and make sure that they are upholding um, good biosecurity principles at the time of the pre-certification. Much of the feedback that we received from our industries said, tell us what we need to do, but don't tell us how to do it. The producers wanted the flexibility to meet the standards as best fit their individual operation. So stay there for a second on this slide. Um, I'm going to give a couple of examples of text from the guidance so that you can see what this looks like. I often use this slide and the next one when I'm presenting to producers so they can have a bit of a glimpse of the language and a bit better understanding of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the guidance. This example is fairly proscriptive. It's on the premises map. Um, the premises management will develop a premises map that must clearly document, and then you can see a list of items that must be marked on the map. However, it is up to the producer to determine where those items are located as it fits their property. Okay, next slide. In this example on SOPs, 
Um, the premises management will be responsible for developing SOPs and training personnel, and the SOPs will include the type of PPE to be used. But we don't tell them which type to use. It's up to them if they want to use disposable or reusable or, or a combination of the two. The type of disinfectant to be used. Again, they choose the type based on what's available and feasible to them, yet still killing the anticipated viruses. Cleaning and disinfection of reusable PPE, if that's applicable. Again, we don't tell them how to see and do it. It's up to them. They just need to decide how and where they're going to do it, et cetera. Okay, next slide. So then as we get into the actual guidance, um, we have some key areas that are in this general portion. I'm just going to kind of go through some of these as well as the biosecurity standards. So first off, um, every farm premises needs to have a national prem identification number. This is for tracing purposes, response purposes, all of those things once we get into an outbreak situation. First off, they need to be able to establish that perimeter, um, and they need to know how they're going to quickly establish the perimeter such that it um, prevents access where it's not wanted. And then there are the biosecurity standards. Next slide. So many, if not all of these on this list should look familiar as the national programs um, because the topics are primarily the same. We have our biosecurity manager, we have gates, lines of separation, your logs, where are you going to do your cleaning and disinfection, your PPE, your signage, those kinds of things. Um, so it, the principles are there. It just may be organized slightly differently, might be categorized slightly differently. But again, since we based our plan on the national plans, many, if not all, of the principles that were evaluated and incorporated into those national plans are included somewhere within these categories. And again, since we're in the general section, these biosecurity principles are written to apply to any production type. Next slide. The remainder of the key areas include equipment and personnel. So if you're going to be sharing equipment or personnel, there are some requirements about how they're going to do that. What are the SOPs? How are employees going to move between premises within a premise? Um, how are you going to monitor, restrict, control your visitor, your foot traffic, requirements for the disposal plan, the pest control plan, the herd flock health monitoring. This is similar to the, it has the same principles as the active observational surveillance that's found in the national plan. And then we have our animal and animal product movement section. So here in the general portion of our plan, we discuss the paperwork, how are you going to transfer those permits? The, you need to have SOPs for putting them into a plastic bag that can be cleaned and disinfected. This is where information is on the haulers and how they need to remain in the cab of the truck at all times. How is feed handled, manure, et cetera. This concludes then the general section of our guidance, and then we move into the um, species specific. So right now we have poultry first, and under our poultry standards, we address issues that are then pertinent and relevant to the poultry industries, including egg pickups, requirements for deliveries of replacement pullets and replacement litter, as well as the handling of the spent hens. In addition, we have some specifics on surveillance sampling that will need to be done by the premises personnel, how to do the sampling as well as the sampling intervals in order to receive those movement permits. In the dairy tab, we address the standards required for moving raw milk. In particular, for raw milk pickups, all premises will be required to supply their own dedicated milk transfer hose. They will not be able to use a transfer hose supplied by the hauler. This, again, is a slight deviation from some of the national plans. Additionally, premises that participate in a co-mingled milk pickup will need to be sampled and weighed by the premises personnel. Since the hauler is not able to get out of the truck, this is one of those responsibilities that needs to be picked up by farm personnel. The guidance provides the sampling requirements that are, again, necessary for the movement permits. Next slide. As we've been going through our process, um, and we started to get some plans back from our testing teams, we realized 
that we also needed to create a plan template. And I say also because the national programs um, have created some templates and some examples to use. What we realized, though, is that because we have our own specific California guidance, those national um, materials, while helpful, did not help people develop a California-approved plan. So we created a plan template um, that is a companion to our guidance and helps our producers meet the requirements and criteria in our guidance. But it's also based on, and we borrow language from the national plans as appropriate. Okay, so now we've completed step one of our five-step process, the creation of the plan. On to step two, the pre-certification. The pre-certification is performed by a regulatory veterinarian. Um, here in California, it can either be CDSA or we work very closely with our USDA counterparts. And it is a comprehensive review of the plan and an evaluation of those SOPs. Um, We've developed a pre-certification checklist that accompanies the guidance document and allows for a yes or no assessment of all the requirements. Do you have it? Yes. Do you have the SOPs? Yes. And then do you have any requirements that are listed in the guidance? Yes or no. Is it adequate to prevent disease transmission? Yes or no. That's the evaluation part. Um, any requirement that receives a no meaning it's not in the plan or it is not or it's deemed inadequate, will receive recommended corrective actions. We will then work with the producers to address the issues and potential challenges to find possible solutions. The pre-certification is both a desk audit of the paper plan as well as a site visit. And we've combined the two because we want to make sure that whatever is written on the plan is actually possible to implement? Can we actually put a fence up in this area or are there, is there something in the way? Is that really the best place for the cleaning and disinfection station and does the drainage actually go the, the correct way, away from the animals, et cetera? Because pre-certification means that the producer has the plan and the SOPs and the capacity to implement the required biosecurity protocols in the face of a disease outbreak. Once they're pre-certified, then technically the producer is ready. Next slide. Then it happens, what we, none of us want. There's an outbreak. A state issued quarantine by the state veterinarian and a stop movement order is issued. Now what? Next slide. Once this happens, the premises will be advised or told, depending on the situation, to activate their secure food supply plans. So at the premises level, what that means is they're putting into action everything that is in their plan, including setting up their perimeter and their internal lines of separation, their cleaning and disinfection stations, their PPE stations. They're going to be implementing their strict record keeping and their logs. They're going to be placing their signs controlling vehicle and people traffic and access, and begin or continue their herd or flock monitoring for signs of disease. At the same time, the regulatory agencies, CDFA and USDA, and the incident management team are going to be conducting their epidemiological investigation and surveillance. They're going to be determining the premises status. They're going to be looking to see who are the infected prems, the suspects, the monitored, they're going to be defining the control zone. Next step. So then we get to verification. So at this point, the plans are activated, and now somebody needs to come out and verify that the plan is activated as it was written. So we envision this step as a sort of a, a yes, no. Again, has it been activated as it was written? And we're going to hit the highlights. We may not hit every aspect of the plan, um, at this point because we want to keep this um, short and to the point and make sure that the biosecurity that is really essential is in place. So some of the key points are the perimeter, the lines of separation, the access points. Again, your C and D and PPE stations, are they up, are they functional, are they being used? Make sure that the surveillance and herd or flock monitoring is in place and making sure that the sampling protocols are being followed. And a yes means that it's been verified and the plan is activated. 
And a no might mean that either there's some aspect of the plan that's not activated, or it might mean that they couldn't activate it the way they'd written it. And at that point, if they had to change their biosecurity protocols, then it's going to need an evaluation by a biosecurity personnel from the um, incident management team. At this point, we're planning on this verification step happening sort of off-site, either at the premises gate or maybe off-site and using photos and explanations and other proof of, um, of activation of the plan. We want to minimize the traffic on and off the prem because, of course, the last thing we want to do is that we don't want to be responsible for spreading the disease from farm to farm. Next step. And so you can imagine that if we have lots of plans pre-certified, lots of plans activated, we're going to have lots of plans and, and premises that need to be verified. We're going to run into a resource problem and resource mobilization. As we thought through this phase of, the, um, of a response, we realized that many, if not most, of our staff veterinarians are going to be responding to the incident either at the field or the command level. Thus, We've been brainstorming about other resources that we can tap into to help with the verification process. Um, other resources that we're looking at include livestock inspectors, milk, milk and meat inspectors, as well as county ag specialists to perform this verification step. Now keep in mind that what we're needing here is somebody who can make that yes, no decision, have they activated what their plan says. There's no evaluation of the biosecurity principles at this point in time which is allowing us to spread beyond somebody who has expertise in biosecurity. Okay, next. All right, so now they have a pre-certified plan that's been activated and verified. We've had our initial surveillance testing done under the direction or by regulatory officials. A premises then may be issued movement permits depending on their location, the surveillance, and the, and the situation of the outbreak. We've made it clear during our guidance as well as during any of our talks to industry that to continue to receive permits during an outbreak, the plan must remain active and the surveillance testing must continue. And that any failure to comply with the standards and the requirements of the secure food supply system may affect the PREM's ability to receive a permit. So, okay, so that finishes our five steps. We made it. Next slide. When I talk with producers, I give the following scenarios about the value of pre-certification. Okay, so we have two farms, Farm A and Farm B. Next. Farm A is going to follow the process as I've outlined it. They develop their plan when things are quiet. They work with their regulatory officials and they get their plan pre-certified. And they have all their, kind of all their ducks in a row. Next. Then there's an outbreak, a quarantine, a stop movement. They activate their plan, they get it verified, and they're issued a movement permit. Again, just the way I've kind of walked through it here in this presentation. Now Farm B, next slide. For whatever reason, maybe the outbreak happens tomorrow, or maybe they didn't have the resources to create the plan ahead of time, hasn't developed their plan prior to the outbreak. The plan will still need to be created and pre-certified. Remember, the pre-certification step is where the biosecurity practices are evaluated. Then the plan will need to be activated and verified prior to the issuance of a permit. Next slide. So I hope you can all appreciate that all things being equal, Farm A is, a is able to move product much more quickly than Farm B during an outbreak. Okay, so that's the structure and the intent of our program. So where are we now? So right now, we're in the middle of conducting what we call our beta test. And we're testing the farm premises guidance document and the pre-certification and validation procedures. To do this, we have each of our CDFA districts up and down the state identifying at least one poultry and one dairy producer to work with. The CDFA and our USDA personnel in those districts are working with producers to develop a secure food supply, a secure food supply plan that is specific to those operations. Once the plans are developed, 
then we're going to test the pre-certification checklist and process. We're then going to activate some of the plans and test the verification procedures. Once we're all done with the beta test, we will probably be revising and finalizing the documents based on the feedback that we get from both our staff as well as the producers who went through this beta test with us. Next slide. A key component of the beta test is developing a standardization procedure. I sort of mentioned it earlier, but our guidance document says that in the SOPs, they must be acceptable to minimize disease transmission. So we need to really define what acceptable is, so that regardless of the person reviewing and pre-certifying a plan, the same criteria are used. Once this standardization is determined, then training both of our personnel as well as industry will be key. Next one. So throughout the beta test, we plan to try to capture some of these best practices. We're going to be collecting video footage and still images and showing the different ways that these standards can be met. As an example, there are different ways to set up a cleaning and disinfection station. Some may use, may have a concrete slab that they can use while well, somebody else may use um, sort of an ad hoc uh, gravel bed that they make at the time. Both of them can meet the requirement of having a appropriate C&D station to meet the biosecurity standards. And so we want to capture some of those different ways that producers come up with to meet the requirements in our guidance. The videos will be added to our existing CDFA as well as the national resource libraries and available for anyone to watch. Um, as an audience, we're targeting uh, these videos and training materials for a couple of different audiences. One, to train our, our CDFA staff, as well as some of those ancillary staff I was talking about who need to do the verification procedures, the ag inspectors and livestock inspectors, um, as well as producers and industry to help them set up their plans to meet the guidance. We really want to make this as quote unquote easy as possible, recognizing that it's not an easy task. Okay, next slide. All right, so we're almost there now. Um, once we have the program tested and refined, we plan to begin a broad statewide outreach and socialization campaign. We want to get as many producers on board and on the way to pre-certification as possible. Um, thinking back to that Farm A and Farm B, right? We want to get as many people in the Farm A category as possible. To do this, we'll be further engaging with our industry here in the state the quality assurance programs, with networks that already exist within the commodities, and with the state veterinary associations and our veterinarians up and down the state to help really, truly try to bring this program into a reality. Next. So what does the future hold? Once we get the details worked out for the farm trends, then we're going to be repeating the process for the haulers, the processors, and the renderers. Because of our earlier work on commodity-specific plans, we have draft guidance for some of these waiting to be refined. Next. We also want to ensure that any species-specific information for the other species is also included in the separate tabs. In addition, we need to further our own internal permitting, ca permitting capacity. We want to be ready on our side to issue the permits. If the industry has done their part to create and pre-certify the plans, then we need to be ready to validate and issue permits in a timely fashion. Lastly, once we get operations on board, we would like to implement pre-certification reviews as well as annual exercises. Next slide. All right, so we know that this is a big and a long-term vision to have all of California animal agriculture on board with a secure food supply. When dealing with our producers, some will have an easier time of getting on board. For some, it will be an easy lift. Next slide. And some, it will take more effort. And next slide. Our goal is to get producers moving along this path to preparedness. How far they get before an outbreak will depend on many factors, such things as timing, if an outbreak happens tomorrow, you know what? We don't have anybody certified. Risk tolerance. A producer will need to decide what fits their business model. Does it make sense to invest the time and resources now? Um, resources. 
a producer needs to decide what level of resources that they have now versus during an outbreak. We remind producers that in a time of peace, quote unquote, i.e. when there's no outbreak, the Secure Food Supply Program is voluntary. They don't have to do this. During an outbreak, however, it will be mandatory to move product. Next slide. So it sometimes is a tall order. However, I'm often comforted by what Dr. Jones told me once, um, which, where she said, each step forward is a step closer to our goal of a secure food supply. Not to let it be too daunting to try to tackle all of these different aspects. We have a plan. We're marching through. Um, and we are open and willing to collaborate with other states or stakeholders along the way as we all work toward our common goals. And with that, I will take any questions. Um, up on the screen is my email. Um, please feel free to uh, email me if you have any, any questions that don't get answered today or if you have any part of your story or your process that you want to share with us. Also, there is a link to our website where our guidance document is currently posted. Um, we're going to be updating the website in the next few months as we get through this beta test to really get all of our resources and documents posted. Um, but the guidance document is up and available if people would like to take a look at it. And ladies right. and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a verbal question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. That's pound two on your telephone keypad. Voice over computer users, you can select the raised hand emoticon from the top toolbar. You will receive a notification once your line has been unmuted, and at that time you can state your name and your question. And as a reminder, if you'd like to send in a written question, select participants from the top of your screen and opt to send note to all presenters. If you have logged in using the web-based application, you'll see the Notes tab, which is on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And you can use that. And then address your question to all moderators. And we do have a couple um, written questions that came in. Um, one participant wanted to know if the slides would be available and or the recording after today's webinar. I can say that I know that the, the webinar will be, it was recorded, and I'll be sending out a link probably in the next probably five days to send that to everyone. Um, I'm not sure about sharing your slides, Dr. Ahrens. Um, I guess I hadn't really thought about it. If, um, if people want the slides specifically, um, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, just send me an email there on my, on my link and, and we, can, we can chat. Um, if the re webinar recording doesn't answer and get you what you need, then just, um, I guess, drop me a line and, and we can chat about what you need. Okay. The next question, actually first they wanted to say excellent report. And to clarify once more, the plan and SLPs written by the producer for pre-certification did not need to be implemented until notice, notified of an outbreak. So is the facility required to maintain any level of biosecurity prior to the event to be pre-certified? Yeah, that is an excellent question and, and one that we talk about internally all the time. Um, so as as we look at it, so two parts here. One is that, yes, the SOPs as written are only for activation of the secure food supply. We just want to see the written plan or the, um, I was describing it yesterday to somebody as write it like the recipe in a cookbook. You know, what do you need? How are you going to do it? Um, we just want to see that written plan ahead of time so that we can ensure that it has good biosecurity principles. But it does not need to be implemented until the secure food supply plan is actually activated. Um, and so we look at the secure food supply plan as, um, as that enhanced biosecurity. We kind of use the, the wartime analogy, if you will. Um, so it's not your everyday biosecurity practices. We hope that people are doing their own level of biosecurity practices on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, that's going to vary uh, producer to producer based on their own sort of risk tolerance, um, you know, and risk level, if you will, right, how many animals are coming in and out and those kinds of things. Um, so the secure food supply, again, is only for when there's those extreme circumstances, foot and mouth disease, high path AI, and it does not touch on the day-to-day -day practices. 
hope that answers the question. Okay, we have another question. Um, is there a producer cost for pre-certification and verification? At this point, we do not have a cost for it, no. Um, the, um, it's a, a service that we provide in terms of pre-certifying the plans and making sure that it meets the requirements. Um, verification, it will happen under the auspices of a response. So, no, there's no, there's no cost to that. Um, there, depending on how producers want to develop their plan, um, if they write it themselves or if they, they hire their um, regular veterinarian to help them as a consultant or whatever, there may be some fees to them in terms of writing the plan. Um, but that's not sort of our jurisdiction. But as far as pre-certification and the verification stages, no, there's no cost. Okay. Um, what input, if any, did industry have in developing your program? That's a good question because I did allude to the fact that we had our little in-house team up here sort of in headquarters in Sacramento. Um, and as they worked on it, though, we also talked some with our district staff who are involved directly with industry. And then it was also sent out to the um, various um, industry stakeholders, some of the groups and, and key people, and we have advisory groups. And so they were tapped into to review the program um, and review the guidance, kind of similar to how the national programs have done it, where they've, they've had representatives from different industries working on those programs. We, too, had industry representatives who were um, reviewing the guidance that we wrote to make sure that it was practical, it was feasible, and it kind of practices. Okay. Another well, question is, will states moving animals or products into California during an outbreak need to follow California plans or the national plan? They would need to follow the California plan, um, is my understanding, and which is why that we've, we've tried to be similar to the national plan and incorporate that and not deviate too much. Um, and and if you read them in the specifics, they're not that different. We might just be a little bit more strict as far as, like I was saying, the hauler has to stay in the truck. Um, but um, they, the principles from the national plan are incorporated. But yes, to come into California, they would need to follow the California plan. Okay. And another question is, what kind of buy-in have you had from producers in California? That's also a good question. Um, and I mean, they're all good questions. But you know. That's, that's one of the tricky parts, right, is, is getting this out into the industry and getting them engaged and getting them involved. Um, so we're um, also taking sort of a multi-prong approach or strategy to this. Dr. Jones spent this last year with um, an overview of the program presentation that she took to all of the industry boards to get all the advisory boards and the members kind of at the, from at the top aware of the program that was coming down. Um, we're also targeting some um, production uh, newsletters and magazines and some of the annual meetings to kind of give an update on the program. Here it's coming. Here's how you're going to be involved, that kind of a thing. The, the real strategy and engagement is going to happen next year when we do that sort of big socialization plan um, that I was mentioning. And so there, part of what we're going to do is try to reach out to individual producers, we're going to go through the vets and talk to the vets and get them on board and try to have them talk to their producers about the importance of it. Um, for the dairy industry, we want to tap into the processors and then have them communicate out to their milk suppliers. So we have some different strategies about how we want to get them on board. Um, and that's why I showed some of the slides that I use um, when I talk to industry to kind of show you that one of one of my strategies is to say, you know, like, this is important, this will help you, this is not hard, we can do this together. Um, I don't want them to feel like this is one more regulatory or regulation coming down that they have to do, um, but this really is in the best interest of them as well as us, as well as California. We do have another written question. Um, in, your pi if, in your pilot runs, how much time has been required for the pre-certification assessment? <laughs> um, and the reason I laugh is that we haven't quite gotten to the pre-certification assessment yet. Um, we had a, a goal to be done with the beta test by this time of year. 
Um, and like all goals, they're kind of a moving target a little bit. Um, and uh, as the first run through of the program, we ran into some early early bumps, such as needing the template for the plan. So that kind of set us back. So at this juncture, what we're doing is we we just recently gotten our last couple of farms identified, um, and we have some plans that have been that have come in and have been kind of reviewed. I would say those early reviews took um, those first couple plans probably took about four hours, maybe four six hours to kind of get through. Um, recognizing that as we went through, it became clear that we needed the template, so it was easy to kind of say, okay, I'm going to stop reviewing. Um, we hope that once we get people using the template and following the order and making sure that we get all the pieces, that part of that process is to speed up the certification process. So that was a long-winded answer to say, I don't know how long pre-certification is going to take because we haven't done any, we haven't really done any yet. We haven't tested that part yet. Okay. Have you had different response levels from different species groups? Um, we have, yeah. Um, and and primarily right now we've been we've been reaching out to the poultry and the dairy industries. Um, and I would say that the um, one it varies in California. It varies uh, by by district and by size of the premises. Um, and the the poultry industry in California is um, they do a lot of day to day biosecurity already, um, right? Biosecurity is kind of more on their radar since the outbreaks of high path avian influenza. Um, the dairy industry here in California, we've been talking about the secure milk supply for a number of years. We've been, been talking about foot and mouth disease. Um, they're a little tired of the talk, um, and for them, it's kind of a harder lift. And so, um, you know, we're going to get some feedback as we go through the beta test as to kind of how hard and if there was an industry difference. But our, certainly our perception coming in um, to the implementation of this program is that, yeah, it is going to be harder for different in industries. And it's also going to vary between different, just different farm management, you know, and different managers. Some people are going to be right on board and, and gung-ho, and some are going to say, not me, not ever. So, and we imagine there's going to be a broad spectrum in between. We have another question. It said, um, you mentioned letting veterinary practitioners serve as consultants to assist your producers in making plans that meet requirements. Will there be specialized training to prepare these veterinary practitioners to properly perform that role? Yes. Um, so that's part of our training and outreach that we're going to do. Um, and because one of the things that we're learning from our beta test, um, so we're continuing to gather that information, is that the people on the farms who are the ones who have the knowledge to write the plans, who are usually the managers, the biosecurity managers or whatever, are often the ones who are the busiest people who don't have the time to sit down to write the plan. And so one of the strategies that we may suggest and, and kind of talk through and, and, and work with our industries and people is to have um, the veterinarian serve that role and be the biosecurity expert or specialist to help them set up those plans with their input. Um, and so for sure, as we do that um, outreach through industry, we also are going to be targeting the vets and doing specific presentations and training on the program on what it takes to write a plan and the different resources that are available. Okay. I don't have any additional written questions. Does anybody want to do a, have, ask a verbal question? Or we still have a few minutes. You can write in a question. Oh, we have one more. Is implementing an approved plan slash SOP the sole requirement for obtaining a permit for a disease like FMV? Um, well, having the um, having the plan and the SOP, um, yes and no. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with that question a little bit, and here's why: is because the plan includes having multiple SOPs, so it's not just one SOP. You, you're going to need an SOP for your cleaning and disinfection, for your PPE, for your signage, for your 
traffic movement, your disposal plan, your pest control plans. So you're going to have multiple SOPs. Um, and, it, and those SOPs are part of the whole secure food supply plan. So once you have that whole thing put together, um, and then it gets pre-certified and verified, um, that's one half of it, right? And then on the other side is um, the epidemiological and the surveillance piece. If you are a prem that ends up being infected, you probably you can't move anything anyways. Um, so even if you have all of your plan in place, you're going to be under a quarantine and a stop movement. So we have to bring in that the context of where the premises is in relation to um, the epidemiology and the definition of the control zones and the free zones and, and monitored areas. So it's not just a, yes, if you have your SOPs check mark, you're good to go. Um, it has to be within context of the outbreak and the response. Okay. We had one participant that gave us a message and said they enjoyed today's webinar. So that was great. Um, are there any other questions? A quick reminder, if you'd like to ask a question over your phone line, simply press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. And voice over computer users, you can click the raised hand emoticon in your top toolbar. At this time, we do not have any further questions. Okay, then. Well, we, we know we have Mandy's uh, email address, so I'm sure if anybody wants to uh, contact her, she'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Um, I'd just like to say thanks again for joining us today, and thank you, Dr. Aaron, for doing the webinar. It was really very interesting. Um, our next webinar is going to be held on January 4th at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time with Dr. Fred Bourgeois, and his topic is on EMRS permitting during a bad response. Hopefully you can join us. Um, have a great rest of your day, and happy holidays, since I don't think I'll be on another webinar until after the first of the year. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you to, um, to Liz and Mary-Kate for helping put this webinar on, and to all of you for joining us today. And the session has now concluded, and you may disconnect. Thank you so much for joining us.